Hi, I am Bablu Loitong Bang and I am going to take a session on the human rights challenges of ethnic minorities in Northeast India. Friends, if you imagine the map of Asia, the Great Himalaya divides the Indian subcontinent and the and, and China, mainland China. The Himalaya, as it grows towards the east, you will see that it tempers down and finally takes a southward turn and splits into little hills and valleys. This is the region that I'm talking about, the blue hills and the green valleys. Presently, uh, this region is consists of eight states of India, starting from Assam, which is the biggest, Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, Manipur, Mizoram, Meghalaya, uh, Tripura, and Sikkim. But if you go a little further into history, in the pre-colonial times, uh, this region was more integrated towards the political, social, economic processes in Southeast Asia rather than South Asia. When the British came and took over this place, it was the first Anglo-Burmese war. Uh, and then gradually as the British uh, find uh, this place to be very suitable for uh, tea plantation, a lot of uh, labors, endangered uh, labors were taken from India and a large number of, uh, a large swap of this uh, region was converted into tea gardens, which we now call uh, the famous Assam tea. But when the British were living again, uh, this uh, area in 1947, um, there were a lot of demands for self-determination uh, to take care of their own future by different groups of people, uh, but uh, this was not uh, very welcomed by the new uh, state that has emerged in Delhi, and and so uh, there has been a kind of um, a low-intensity conflict that has been going on ever since. But besides the uh, the human story, this is also a very interesting place where the cultures as well as the flora and fauna of South Asia, Southeast Asia and Far East Asia mix, mingles and melts into different forms of uh, you know, uh, habitation. At the moment, there are more, hundred and, uh, more than 220 languages that is still spoken in this area. And it belongs to different language family, uh, starting from Indo-Aryan to uh, Tibeto-Burman to Austro-Asiatic languages, uh, and an and array of uh, tribes to people consisting uh, from anywhere from 100,000 uh, population to less than 1,000 population. So this is a very interesting array of people. Uh, but as I was telling you, the, the political story behind this uh, is that uh, ever since this became a part of the Indian Union, uh, there has been tensions uh, among some uh, tribes or some pe indigenous peoples in this region. As a result of which, uh, particularly the Naga tribes have been particularly assertive about their uh, separate identity and in response to this the government of India had uh, imposed a law called the Armed Forces Special Powers Act which is uh, an area that I'm going to be discussing today and uh, if you look back again to the history of this Armed Forces Special Powers Act it started in again the British colonial times in the hit of the Second World War in 1942 to be precise, when India also started its Quick India movement. 
uh, the Gandhis and the Nehru's were demanding British to live India uh, in response to this uh, demand for independence the British government at that time imposed uh, this law called the Armed Forces Special Powers Ordinance which allows the military uh, to use force to the extent of causing death and there could be no legal action against them uh, because it was done uh, in, in, in exercise of sovereign power. Well, fortunately or unfortunately, in five years' time, India got independence uh, uh, in 1947. Uh, but the same law, and, and there and after, of course, this ordinance is gone, uh, but a similar law came into being specifically for the northeast region uh, that I was talking about. Uh, and this time it is called the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, 1958. And within bracket they say Assam and Manipur, because at that time pretty much the whole region uh, was uh, not uh, eight states, but it was basically Assam, Manipur, and Tripura. So it covers pretty much the whole region except Tripura. And this law uh, came into being primarily to deal with, uh, you know. Uh, subdue the self-determination movement which was gradually uh, becoming quite a menace for the uh, rulers in New Delhi. This law is also similar to the 1942 uh, ordinance but in fact this has become even more draconian. The power to shoot and kill someone was given to the level of an army captain in the 1942 ordinance but this has been devolved from a commission officer, which is the captain, to a junior commission officer, to a non-commission officer. So this is like any officer in the, um, the military can actually order to use force to the extent of causing death in Northeast Territory. And this was 1958. And uh, when this issue was debated in the in the parliament. Uh, the then Home Minister uh, promised that this is going to be only a temporary measure. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, this law continued for a long period of time. And even today, in 2021, uh, instead of this law going away as a temporary measure, it gradually started spreading. Uh, so. First of all, it was only in the Naga Hill district of Assam that it was originally imposed, uh, but it gradually uh, spread to Manipur, to uh, Assam, to Tripura, uh, and the whole northeast region was pockmarked with a uh, disturbed area under this Armed Forces Special Powers Act. Uh, many uh, United Nations human rights procedure, uh, attention has been drawn on this particular law and uh, we have raised these issues uh, as human rights activists in the United Nations Human Rights Committee, for example, which monitors the, uh, the implementation of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And the Human Rights Committee have come out clearly saying that this exercise of power to such an extent uh, is actually exercising emergency power without resorting to the necessary procedure that needs to be followed when emergency powers are exercised. Uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on uh, Summary Arbitrary and Extrajudicial Execution, uh, for example, after his visit to India in 2012, have commented that uh, this law, the power that is given in this law, cannot be used uh, even in an emergency situation because uh, a law, a, a right to life which cannot be derogated from uh, even in situation of emergency seems to be uh, suspended when the Armed Forces Special Powers Act is applied. So we have uh, exhausted uh, the literally the, the UN procedures uh, the Supreme Court of India, in its judgment in uh, 19, 
97 have basically upheld also the constitutionality of this Armed Forces Special Powers Act and the uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Execution uh, have uh, said that uh, a court like the Supreme Court of India which is otherwise so progressive in, in upholding human rights, uh, Professor Christoph Heinz uh, at that time uh, who was the Special Rapporteur uh, have also commented that he failed to understand how the Supreme Court of India could possibly upheld a law like this. Well, how do we deal with this kind of a situation and how do we fight back for human rights uh, is the fundamental challenge that we have been dealing with for a long time. Uh, so, uh, as human rights activists, we have been documenting uh, cases of what is called extrajudicial execution of people. People are being killed on suspicion uh, and we have a large amount of this documentation with us. Uh, so after, especially after the UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Execution had come to India and have done a report, uh, we were encouraged to go to the Supreme Court of India, uh, not challenging the, the act per se, but uh, seeking how do the victims who are being victimized by this law can get justice from the Supreme Court. So we compiled 1,528 cases of extrajudicial executions under the SEDU of Armed Forces Special Powers Act and, and we petitioned the Supreme Court in the form of a public interest litigation saying that this clearly violates the right to life which is guaranteed by the Constitution of India under Article 21 and uh, therefore uh, when right to life is violated in such large scale, uh, the court should intervene and uh, ensure that uh, justice is done uh, for these victims. Uh, so after a lot of deliberation, after the court's own fact-finding, uh, you know, where they have appointed a, a, a commission of inquiry headed by a former judge of the Supreme Court it's himself, and uh, they examined the cases and uh, this commission has said that uh, there is merit to what we are saying because uh, there were two versions of the story, the story that the security forces who are indulging in these killings says that these are uh, what you call encounter killings, that uh, when we were going for patrolling, these terrorists or insurgent groups fired on them and then they fired back and as a result of which, in that exchange of fire, the person died. Whereas the version from the family's side is that, no, this is not true. Uh, the person was there at home. He was picked up from home. And two days later, he was found in, an, in, 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 a, in a hillock, uh, found dead with telltale signs of torture. And therefore, this was... Uh, custodial killing using force. So when the fact-finding committee came down to the field to Manipur uh, and examined these cases, uh, in six selected cases, they found that the version of the family uh, has more evidence and more uh, reliable than the one that the security forces have always been saying. So after that, we were in a very good position uh, in the Supreme Court uh, and the Supreme Court had finally come out with a historic judgment in 2016 uh, saying that irrespective of whether there is Armed Forces Special Powers Act or not, every killing by excessive use of force or this kind of custodial killing, in short, this extrajudicial execution uh, cases needs to be registered, criminal cases needs to be registered, and investigation should take place. So after this judgment, uh, next year in 2017, the Supreme Court have uh, constituted uh, a special investigation team, and the special investigation team was given uh, 39 cases out of this 1,528 cases uh, to be examined. And today, uh, some of the examinations have been uh, completed and about 100 policemen are now indicted for charges of murder.
However, the problem is none of the military personnel who was involved in this uh, are indicted. And even though the story that the investigating agency has uncovered clearly reveals the involvement of this military personnel, sometimes independent of the police, sometimes in cohort with the police, uh, uh, none of them are indicted. And um, the investigating agency, uh, when they ask for this prosecution sanction that is required from the central government to prosecute a military personnel, this prosecution sanction is always denied. If I may recall, the Armed Forces Special Powers Act uh, in Section 6 clearly says that for any act done under this act or purported to be done under this act, no legal action can be taken unless and until there is a sanction from the central government. So we are now have facing a situation where the government's own investigating agency clearly established the sequence of event where many military personnel are involved in extrajudicially executing citizens. Uh, however, because there is no sanction uh, given from the central government to prosecute them, they are still at large, they are still in service and they are not being held accountable for carrying out this uh, very serious human rights violation, namely killing people uh, without a judicial pronouncement. So this is the state of affair that uh, we are in today. Uh, uh, but let me also uh, bring to you uh, another aspect that is number one challenge that we are facing, so to speak, where uh, despite of the long journey and monumental effort put in by the civil society, the victim families, as well as the, uh, uh, the human rights uh, movement within uh, the Northeast region, but also outside, uh, you know, human rights lawyers in Delhi, as well as UN procedures like the Human Rights Committee or the Special Rapporteurs, uh, we are still yet to cross uh, the boundaries and the barriers of impunity that we experience. The second challenge that I want to uh, highlight is the whole issue of drug trafficking. We know that uh, across the world, two very important point of where uh, a large scale uh, narcotic drug is produced is the Golden Triangle and the Golden Crescent. Uh, the Golden Triangle is the tri-junction between Thai, Myanmar, uh, Laos area uh, and there used to be a lot of production of heroin and all this kind of uh, new drugs. Uh, amphetamine and all this. Uh, but what we are realizing is that nowadays uh, there has been some improvement, especially when Myanmar was going to a more democratic and open society. There was a slight reduction in the production of uh, poppy there. But slowly we are realizing that uh, many of this poppy cultivation are also spreading on this Indo-Myanmar region. Uh, this region is also again not fully controlled by their respective governments. There are a lot of armed groups operating in this area and poppy cultivation being highly lucrative in terms of its monetary return. Uh, we came to realize that this whole Indo-Myanmar region also there has been uh, the, the poppy cultivation was spreading like wildfire in the last decade or so. Interestingly, uh, sometimes the top military officials, uh, very high-ranking politicians, their families are caught red-handed uh, in trafficking this drug because these are again, um, you know, the border between Myanmar and India are also very porous, uh, not controlled by, uh, effectively by the, by the military on both sides, but also there are a lot of military checkpoints because of the ongoing insurgency in the region for a long time. And to have large-scale poppy cultivation in this area, uh, it is impossible to have these without some kind of acquiescence of the authority that be, be it the, uh, the military authority or be it the, the local civil politician or the armed groups who are controlling this uh, 
uh, area. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, um, when people are caught red-handed, uh, the, the law enforcement agency are so weak and so corrupt uh, and, uh, and the courts themselves seem to be caving into this uh, to pressure because uh, drug lords have uh, extremely long pocket and, and somehow uh, there has not, not been a single uh, conviction of this big fish who are arrested. You know, the media would expose this. It can even become an issue in the assembly. Uh, but when it comes to actually, uh, you know, uh, actual trial of this uh, drug lords, they always find uh, 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 the loophole of the legal system and, and try to escape. So, the civil society groups, the uh, former drug users, and, and the number of drug users in this area in northeast region is much much higher than the rest of the country because because of this production again a lot of young people fall victim to this um, drug addiction because the large scale availability has really led people to you know uh, uh, get trapped into this whole vortex of this uh, drug addiction. So we have also formed under the, because uh, under the sustainable development goal, uh, goal number three is basically looking at health, and within that goal number three, target number five uh, talks about uh, the, the the menace of drug and talks about uh, prevention uh, as well as treatment. Uh, uh, many of the concerned civil societies have also come together and call ourselves the 3.5 collective, where former drug users. Uh, students unions because again it's mostly young people who are affected the women's groups uh, who are who have been traditionally very active in trying to keep the, the 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 health of the society and fighting social injustices uh, uh, we have come together in order to uh, establish accountability in the uh, in the enforcement of drug laws in the context of Manipur the third issue that I would like to talk about is the, the present crisis of Myanmar refugees. Uh, as we all know, uh, the February coup in Myanmar and the spring revolution uh, of uh, resisting this and the concomitant crackdown uh, which has come about by the Takma law has uh, forced many people to flee Myanmar. Uh, so, uh, thousands of Myanmar citizens have crossed over to the Indian side as well. I think there is also a large number on the on the Thai Burma border, uh, but large number of uh, Myanmar refugees have come towards the Indian side. Uh, but unfortunately, government of India have come up with a notification on the 10th of March, uh, saying that uh, instructing its security forces and intelligence agencies to push back the illegal immigrants. Uh, this is uh, very unfortunate uh, because uh, this kept the desperate people uh, nowhere to go. Uh, but fortunately or unfortunately, these places are also not entirely under the control of the uh, security forces uh, because many of these places are porous and, and people do slip into uh, the, the isolated villages and, and they are in thousands now. Um, interestingly, the government of Mizoram uh, has taken uh, a very strong position saying that uh, because the Mizo people and the Chin people in the Chin state of Myanmar are ethnic brothers and therefore we will give food and shelter to these people. So the Myanmar, the Mizoram government in defiance to the central government's uh, directive have opened up camps and, and, and uh, let people to come and they are feeding them and also giving them a roof for them to pass over this uh, very difficult times. Whereas, uh, unfortunately, the government of Manipur, because Mizoram and Manipur are the ones which is receiving maximum number of uh, refugees, uh, initially taught the central government's line and have basically um, said that they are not, uh, uh, the, these refugees are not welcome. But again, uh, there was an 
public outcry against this. This is completely unfair uh, and, and inhuman and this is not certainly not uh, in consonance with India's constitutional obligation as well as the human rights obligation and, and therefore because of public pressure the government of Manipur turned around, uh, took a U-turn and have basically said that uh, we will allow humanitarian uh, aids to be given to these people. However, uh, despite of the sweet words, the, the humanitarian aid never came about. So the civil society in Manipur today are mobilizing ourselves uh, to give uh, you know, uh, humanitarian aid to, this, to these people. Interestingly, uh, international agencies like the UNHCR is not given mandate to operate in these areas uh, because the Northeast India is always considered as some kind of a national security zone and up until about uh, five years uh, people of foreign nationals cannot enter into these areas uh, without a special permission so agency international agencies uh, like the UNHCR cannot get access uh, to this area so this is making the life of the uh, refugees extremely difficult. They cannot apply for their refugee status unless and until they go to New Delhi. But to go to New Delhi, you need an identity card to take a flight. Uh, it's, it's more than uh, 2,000 kilometers. And now, because of the pandemic situation, it is extremely difficult to move. So the, the uh, life-saving uh, responses that the citizens of Manipur have given is uh, another challenge and this is particularly compounded uh, by the fact that international agencies are not given access and whereas the situation is Myanmar is going from bad to worse and in the long run uh, in the next at least one or two years uh, we are going to see a lot more people coming into this uh, crossing the border and, and uh, looking for uh, some way to live and continue to live. So this is uh, the other challenge that I wanted to highlight. And finally, um, because of its geographical position, uh, Northeast is a very strategic place. Uh, if one can you know, uh, claim for fame uh, in terms of its geostrategic uh, positioning, uh, this is the, the place where the Second World War uh, turn its tight. The, the Japanese arm, um, this is the place where Japanese army could move uh, to the westernmost point, to this town that I am uh, staying now, Imphal, is the place where the Japanese uh, have to pack up and turn back and, and move back east. This is where the Allied and the Japanese forces fought a bitter war uh, which consumed more than uh, 30,000 uh, Japanese army uh, and, and, and so this is a place of a very important geopolitical positioning. Now India is increasingly looking towards its southeast neighbor to integrate its economy uh, and India has embarked upon a policy called the Act East policy uh, in trying to integrate its economy more with uh, Southeast Asian countries. Uh, this means that there is going to be a large scale uh, infrastructure development uh, projects coming in uh, and uh, India is also looking at the perennial river that is flowing down from the Himalayas uh, as a source of what they consider as green energy to, to produce electricity. So uh, as many as 169 hydroelectric mega dams are being planned across the northeast region. However, the danger is that this region being uh, an extremely sensitive seismic zone, uh, uh, one wonders what is going to be the impact of this kind of uh, developmental intervention of this scale. Uh, the, also, the other concern is also when all these mega development uh, plans takes place, when all these extractive industries, because of this is also a uh, very oil rich uh, region, uh, the indigenous people are not being consulted. The free prior informed consent, uh, which is a basic standard uh, internationally uh, for the 
indigenous peoples uh, movement uh, is still a very alien term here. Uh, the minimal environmental impact assessment that needs to be done uh, when these mega projects are conducted are done only in namesake and very often these are glossed over. So uh, would the indigenous people in this region actually benefit from these mega development projects or are they going to be just pushed aside, further marginalized in the new uh, neoliberal developmental activities going to take place here is, is the critical question. Uh, if the, the indigenous population, the indigenous people in this region are also taken as equal partners, perhaps uh, this region can also transform into some kind of a, a, a hub for uh, various uh, uh, key important strategic uh, partner in development where the benefits are also uh, shared by the indigenous community or are they going to be further pushed and marginalized uh, in which case the ongoing uh, armed conflict and disturbances uh, uh, is going to continue. So these are some of the fundamental challenges that I wanted to share for the Northeast people. Uh, on the one hand, um, uh, there is reason to hope uh, that perhaps uh, with India responding in a more democratic way uh, in partnership with the people uh, and, and, and uh, in uh, following the uh, respecting the human rights of these people can grow as partners with the indigenous communities here or if we are going to roller cost uh, and, and, and push these people who are anyway getting the brunt of the state for a long time uh, then uh, that there is going to be bound to be conflict and unrest and uh, considering the very sensitive nature of this region uh, it can it can escalate to uh, much more uh, violent geopolitical uh, you know, game and chess it can become the chess board uh, of uh, larger geopolitics in this uh, region thank you very much friends for your time uh, and uh, yeah i'm happy to respond to any question uh, as and when it emerges thank you very much